You're listening to Creatives Off Script, presented by Assemble, a podcast where we learn process from inside the world's most successful creative organizations. I'm your host, Nate Watkin, and today we're speaking with David Weinstein, Vice President of Production at Complex. There are six things that I kind of say that every producer needs to have. Uh, a few of them are, are just being transparent and, and having organization, right? Like it doesn't matter what organization system it is, but you have to have a system. Welcome to our show, David. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Nate. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we always like to start the show just hearing a little bit about your background, how you came to uh, the position that you're in now. So tell me a bit about your childhood and uh, what you wanted to be when you grew up. Well, I have to say, because my mother might be watching this, that my childhood was wonderful. Um, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I, I actually did not think that I was going to get into this industry um, as a kid. It really, it really wasn't until um, my freshman year of college, where I, I worked my first gig, um, which was at NBC Sports, um, and that was in 1997. I was a little bit of a Nepo baby. I had a cousin um, who at the time was a production manager for NBC Sports, and she brought me on to be a runner at the French Open. Um, and I, I think you can imagine that spending two and a half weeks in Paris uh covering the sport that you played as a kid and running around and literally my job was like find john McEnroe. um and that was all of our jobs actually as runners it was find john McEnroe, make sure make sure he doesn't get lost or make sure he gets to the booth on time but yeah like two and a half weeks in paris i fell in love with the biz i loved the travel i loved like the feeling of being on set and sitting in the edit room and um i remember um Al Zamansky, uh, who at the time was was working at NBC, and, and he ended up, you know, winning awards and producing Thirty for Thirties, directing Thirty for Thirties. He was a feature producer at the time for NBC, and I just remember being in the back of the edit room, watching this guy go, um, and just thinking to myself, "Wow, like this is what I want to do. I want to tell stories. I want to be in the middle of this." And so that was the bug that got me, and and I've been doing production, TV, content, video ever since, um, in kind of various forms. So. What about you? How did you get into the biz? Oh, me. <laughs> um, so my background, you know, I, I started my production company, my first production company out of college when I was 19. Oh, uh, shit. That eventually took me to Los Angeles where I would run that production company for about a decade, uh, you know, which is really growing up in that industry and just learning everything from the inside out. So, yeah. I did the same thing. I started my production company when I was... Was it 2020? So I must have been in 2004. I was, it was like 25, 26 when we started ours and ran it for 10 years. Um, yeah. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I I'm not running a production company now. Um, <laughs> no, no, no shade to people running production companies now, but it's stressful. You know that. I mean, it's it's yeah. really, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You got to wear all all the hats all the time. Yeah. For, for um, sure. But yeah, I mean, I would love to hear more about that. So that was East Pleasant Pictures then. Yeah, East Pleasant, sure. Cool. Yeah, and like, I mean, would love to hear about that experience. Uh, like, but mainly just like what you learned from being an entrepreneur. I learned how to do so many things the wrong way as an entrepreneur, um, and 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 certainly a lot of things the right way. But um, we were really lucky when we started East Pleasant, and it was a really kind of fortuitous um, way that we started it. So when we started the company, myself and, my, and one of my business partners, we were staff at a startup called College Sports Television. This was back in 2004. And um, because we were a startup, like we were all feature producers, me and my friends, and we were running around the country doing all of these stories. And at the time we were shooting on mostly two cameras, right? The Sony VX2000, the Canon XL1, you know, obviously the, the VX2000 is a legendary camera, especially if you shoot skateboard videos, like it's, it's, a, it's a beast. I still see kids shooting on the streets in New York with the Sentry Optics fisheye lens. And like, I love that camera. I certainly, the VX, uh, the H, uh, the XL1 was a great camera, but we wanted more and we were kind of frustrated with like how far we could push these cameras. And so one day my, my future business partner, who's my coworker, Stash, and we had been runners together at NBC. We worked together. He kind of, we were out at the bar doing something. He's like, you're like let's go buy a camera. And at the time, Panasonic had just come out with the DVX100, um, which if you know you were an early creator kind of content person in the early 2000s, 
the DVX100 was just like a revolutionary camera, right? Because it shot progressive and 24p. It just did a lot that like other cameras couldn't do. And it was like a, a slimmed down version of like the Panasonic Vericam. And it just looked great. It looked different than anything else that people were shooting. And so we went out and we bought a used DVX100. And we shot something for CSTV. And then my boss at the time, Emily Deutsch, who's still at, uh, well, CSTV got bought by CBS and she's still there. And she's one of the greatest bosses of all time. Shout out Emily Deutsch. Um, she saw what we shot and she was like, what is this? And we were like, well, we shot it on our new camera. And she was like, do more. And Stasha and I looked at each other like, okay, but we're going to charge you for it. And I don't know where we got the stones to like say, like, we're going to charge our boss to use our camera, but that's what we said. And they actually were like, fine. And so we ended up like renting the camera back to the company that we were working at. And in like 10 days, we paid for that camera. Um, and instead of paying ourselves, like we had jobs already. So it's like, fuck, let's just buy more equipment. Uh, and we spent like the next year and a half just buying more and more equipment and really just mostly shooting for CSTV. And then eventually we got some new clients and all that. The wild thing about it was we didn't even have an office. So CSTV actually let us, they gave us a gear room at our building in, in Chelsea Pierce. And we housed all of our equipment in the offices of CSTV and eventually like people found out and they were like, why do these guys get to run a production company inside? And we were just like, I don't know. Cause they're letting us, we had PAs for other jobs, like coming into the building and like grabbing equipment and people would just be like, who are these guys? And we're like, Oh, they work for us. It was like the, it was the funniest thing, but that got us off the ground. And then we ran that company for 10 years. We started doing content and kind of in 2004, 2005, 2006, when digital was really blowing up and everybody wanted content before YouTube. Um, and then eventually we started working with more brands and agencies. And we were doing first like behind the scenes or maybe proofs of concept or maybe some demo reels. And that eventually turned into doing bigger branded content and eventually spots and we had our Super Bowl spot one year. Um, we won an Emmy one year. And it just was like this amazing experience. And then after 10 years, I think we all started kind of growing up. We had families. Um, one of my partners wanted to do more documentary work. One of my partners wanted to become a union director. One of my partners wanted to kind of explore and do more creative stuff. So we broke up the business and kind of went our, our ways. And um, it was a wild ride, though. I mean, we, we had such a blast doing it. And I'm thankful that I shut it down like before like this time now, because I'm like, you know, I moved agency side and I, and I ended up moving publisher side. And I'm really thankful that I had those opportunities that I'm not running a production company right now. Yeah. 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 I remember that grind of just trying to get all that equipment and purchase it and like find a place to put it. Like that's the traditional startup production company story. So I can relate to that. Yeah. I mean, thankfully at the time there were less, there were less options. Yeah. For us, it was the five D. Right. The 5D, like that was the next, that was the next step when, when everyone went from like the HVX 200, the Panasonic HVX 200, and then like red came out with their camera. It was too expensive. Yep. The red one. Yep. And then everybody started shooting on DSLRs and the 5D. Yeah. But then you had the HVX with the red rock micro adapter. Did you Please. Ever use that? Everybody used the red <laughs> rock adapter. Well, because it had that, like, it like had that like film, you know, you had that film look. And there was right. that, you know, like the adapter had that like spinning wheel on it that gave it that film look, but that spinning wheel always broke. And so like, yeah, yeah. then you'd, then you'd be on set and like the thing would, would, would crap out. And then, I mean, back then I just felt like there was, we were all kind of stitching this together and, and we mm -hmm. saw on the horizon, like what union production companies were doing, the you know, big commercials were doing, they were all using like either film or then they were eventually mm -hmm. switching to you know, when red came out with more advanced cameras or then Ari started yeah. coming out with more cameras, but we were just all like posers at the time. We were just trying to keep up with everybody else and pretend, pretend like we knew what we were doing. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Cool. So after the uh, production company became head of production at laundry service, um, you were aligning a team of 60 people across three cities. Like what was the biggest challenge here? And uh, what did you learn from that experience? I mean, I think the biggest challenge at laundry service was just that it was such a young company. Um, I mean, 
being a young company, they still had some incredible clients. So at the time we were social agency of record for Jordan brand. We were social AOR for Hennessy. We were social AOR for Beats. And so like even before I started laundry service, they had really amassed an absolutely impressive list of clients. So in a lot of ways, my job was like, don't break what works. Um, but we were also trying to um, stand up like a media company within laundry service. And that was Cycle. And we were trying to do a lot of content, a lot of original content. So it was like, make sure that your brands are happy. And that was LG Mobile, Hennessy, Beats. Um, and then also try to like start this production company. And we were trying to become kind of the next complex. And I remember we brought in people from complex, a lot of creatives, and we were trying to kind of replicate their model. And it's ironic that I went from kind of working at a company that was trying to be complex to what is that? Seven years later, five years later, working at complex, which, which was really funny for me. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was wild. And, and it was social. I mean, it was really and what laundry service was doing, which was just brilliant. And, and I think that, you know, Jason Stein was was really a mastermind at this was like he understood that owning the media spend and the creative in the same place was the secret sauce. And so we were executing on campaigns and coming up with creative and then shooting it like the next day or that day and then putting media behind it without having to like work with a media agency or wait to kind of for the plant, like we were doing it all ourselves. Like, and I remember, like, I remember like this one time where we, Stranger Things had just come out. And at the same time, there was this, um, some dance that was, that was kind of going viral. And like, we ended up like hiring kid actors in one day, getting them dressed up like the Stranger Kids things and teaching them that dance. And then like the next day we shot it. And then it went live that night and that thing, like we were working so fast um it was such an exciting time and it was a really great place to work from from a content side like we were just wild and, and and really having a lot of fun with it yeah and because you were trying to become a media company there were you building out like in-house studios like what did that internal production capability look like yes i mean we were basically running we were running a production company within the agency um which at the time there were some agencies that were doing that but i don't think anybody was doing it quite like we were i mean vayner was doing the same thing at the time and i think that there were some other companies that were kind of starting like pivoting from being a production company to kind of being an agency and i remember like mustache was doing the same thing at the time and and, and you know they're owned by edelman now um like but there were very few at the time like production companies that were acting in creative capacities um and there were not a lot of agencies that were really saying like, all right, we need to, we need to, they were talking about it, but not a lot were doing, I think what we were doing, what Vayner was doing. Um, and so like, I think those models that we were all kind of collectively building together really set the stage for what you have now, which is like every agency now has in-house production, um, at least in some capacity and, 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 and being able to kind of scale up. That being said, I don't think a lot of agency production departments are still nearly as nimble as, as a lot of the social agencies back then. I mean, I think that like social was so new back then that like there just weren't as many rules and we were really able to work a lot faster. I mean, listen, agencies can still work fast, but I think back then we were just lightning fast. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And so speaking of complex, you move into the VP of production role there and really interesting time because you were charged with, you know, running this massive content operation. But at the same time, COVID-19 hits and uh, you were charged with moving that entire workflow to the cloud. So tell me how you manage that process. Well, I, I it was the wildest time in, my, in the history of my career. Like I and, and to be honest, I don't think there was a period of time that I've been more proud of. Um, and I've talked about this a lot, like like that period just between February of 2020 and May of 2020, the number of people that innovated and pivoted and bought into um, preparing and then being proactive against like virus planning and all of that was incredible. So we were fortunate. And I, and I think that like, and I, and I have to thank, you know, Christian Basler and Justin Killian and Rich Antonello for like buying into all of my like chicken little fear that I kind of was doing in February of 2020, because basically, and I remember this, like in early February of 2020, like, I think they like just shut down Italy. Um, and I went over to our head of operations at laundry service and, and Jay Salim, and I was basically like, listen, 
like they're shutting down Italy. What are we doing? And and I said, I'd like to I'd like to put together a plan, like just in the event, like they shut New York down. And this was really like nobody was thinking that they were going to shut New York down. But mm-hmm. I was like, well, what do we have to lose? And so it was myself. It was Jen Stewart, who was overseeing studio and, and post operations. Um, and then our whole production team, as well as our IT team, um, Jermaine Harrell and, 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 and kind of like his whole department. And we basically just sat down. And I remember it was like, I asked our, 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 our CTO, Alexi, I was like, if we needed to work from home and move everything to the cloud and nobody's allowed to leave their houses, can we do that? And we had this whole meeting and they were basically like, yeah, like we're all set up to do it. So we had already, we had already bought into an iconic, like our, our, um, God, what's the phrase? Like the cloud editing, um, system, yeah, right? So we already, we, we already had everything up there. Like we had our servers mm-hmm. set up. We had all of our, our systems set up. And so basically when we started talking in February, 2020, I was like, can we do this? And it was like, yeah. So at that point in mid February, we, sent all of our editors home with gear. We started building out fly kits so that all of our editors had all of their equipment at home. We mandatory made all of our post-production team as well as all of our on-air hosts and producers upgrade their internet. And so we did that before March of 2020. And we basically, the company paid for that. We basically said, upgrade your internet now, make sure that you have fast internet in case we can't leave our homes. And like, that was our North Star, right? Like, like that was, we had this document called Plan B and plan B had three stages and stage was stage one was like, you can't travel. Stage two was you can't get into the office. And I don't know why that was stage two. And stage three was you can't leave your home, like total lockdown. And so everything that we prepared for was stage three, can't leave your home. So our editors upgraded their internet speed. They all went home with equipment. All of our hosts went home with microphones we ordered ring lights. And so we had all of this stuff done and bought and in their homes, probably by the first week of March in 2020, so between March 1st and March 13th of 2020, we were rehearsing shows, like remote versions of our shows in the office. Like I remember for Full Size Run, um, like we had people in different rooms for Everyday Struggle. We had our hosts, each of our hosts in different rooms around the office, teaching them how to be hosts in a remote version. And then two weeks later, we had to do it for real. Um, and so we were so prepared. Like, I don't think I've seen another company who did what we did, where we like were so proactive and ready to go, so that like when March fifteenth or whatever rolled around, we flipped the switch and it was like, all right, everything we practice is now being put into place. And I think we were dark for a couple days on everyday struggle, and then a week later, after the, like everyone got sent home, we were doing four episodes a day remote, uh, hot ones. We we had a plan where like, you know, we were like, how do you do hot ones remotely? And so. Uh, Dominique Burroughs and, and, and Chris Schomberger and the, and the Hot Ones team was like, all right, well, we can, you know, send a box of sauces to our guests and we'll just uh, order wings at their local restaurant. And like we had a plan for that. And we basically created a home version, a remote version for every single one of our shows. And so we didn't miss a beat. Um, and, and, and so in April of 2020, we ended up while everybody else was like, oh, this thing is going to pass or figuring it out. In April of 2020 and May of 2020, we, we launched eight new shows, eight remote shows that we launched at Complex and First We Feast. Um, hmm. And yeah, like when I say that, that we did as well, if not better than any other production company or media company, I'm not lying. Like I think we did as, as well as we could have done. And, and that was a testament to the buy-in from leadership and and from everybody who believed that we could pivot and innovate. And subsequently, we had no layoffs. Um, Complex was one of the only media companies that I knew of that, that didn't furlough anybody, didn't lay anybody off. Um, and we ended up creating some shows in that period that we ended up producing two years later, like Sneaker Battles was a pandemic show that we created, that Tony Mui created in April of 2020. That ended up being a show that we produced two years later. Um, Fridge Tours was a show that we produced down the line. So we were really fortunate that we had a lot of people at Complex who were really innovative and empathetic to the fact that like they had to allow for change and 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 pivot and kind of bought into that. So I, I can't say enough. Like that was a wild experience, but I'm really yeah. proud of what we did. Yeah, I'm really proud of what we did. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And and you mentioned iconic. Um, curious to just know like. 
what your tool set was to move that to the cloud? Like, how are you keeping everyone connected? How are you tracking this without being in the office together? Yeah, I mean, so so with regards to Iconic, I mean, it was our head of post, Joe Schaefer, our head of media management, Damon Byrne, and they basically, they got all of our editors on board. So, um, you know, we were we were obviously recording everything on Zoom, and so everything was being uploaded, you know, proxy files uh, into Iconic, or full files into Iconic, and then they were editing on proxy files. And so Joe was organizing everything and and then managing that with all of our editors, but he just did a masterful job. I mean, I, I didn't even see the day to day, but he did something right because everything was organized and everything was there. And so all of our footage was in the cloud. Every once in a while, somebody would have to come into the office and you know, dump something or maybe pick something up. But it was very rare in that first few months when like everybody was heightened, very few people actually came into the office. We did a ton of our of our content was remote. I think the only exception being um, after what happened in Louisville with, with Breonna Taylor and, and in Minneapolis with George Floyd. At that point, we, we started sending some crews out uh, from Complex News and then we were capturing some stuff in the field. But otherwise, everything was was remote. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And uh, would love to dig into that process a little bit now. Obviously, you're bringing decades of experience with you to this role um, and have really, you know, uh, perfected your process. And I think a lot of our, our listeners and viewers would love to know somebody who's been in these positions that you've been in. What does that process look like? How do you create this workflow for your team and how are you planning to scale that up with this new company? Yeah, for sure. I think so. I mean, if you've ever worked for me, you're probably going to like get PTSD by me saying this, but like, you know, there are six things that I kind of say that every producer needs to have. Uh, a few of them are, are just being transparent um, and, and, and having organization, right? Like it doesn't matter what organization system it is, but you have to have a system and that system has to enable um, transparency for all teams, right? And I'm, I've never been one to kind of like, I want everyone to be able to see and access information and to be able to like, to not have to come to you say, hey, where is this? But rather like, teach me how to use the system and, and let me use it. So um, right now we, we have a database and kind of pipeline, a content pipeline built in Airtable. Um, that was kind of modeled off, off a couple processes that I had back in Complex. Um, I, can, I can show you, you want me to show you, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's jump in. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, you know, so basically the way the way that I, I built this system, um, which is a little bit different than all, you know, any system I've done. But the big thing for us was I wanted to make sure that the content that we were posting on social um, was easily identified by sport and then easily identified um, by status and then by a grading system. Right. And so um, everything that we do, you know, if I'm going into, say, Karjitsu, I, obviously, I can see, you know, you know, clips that have come in that need to be graded, clips that need to be scheduled, right? So they're already done and and maybe need to be, um, you know, put on our social calendar. Um, and then obviously clips that have already been aired. And then when I go even deeper into that, then I can see, obviously, this has not been graded because these are not been graded clips. But if I go into like ready for scheduling, um, then I can kind of go in and I can see, you know, there are some clips that I've given an A or an A minus, and these are our top clips. And there's some other clips that, you know, maybe highlights that, you know, are, are good, but not amazing. And then, you know, I've come across highlights where I'm just going to like give it a C or even like a D. I'm like, you know, we're probably never going to air that. Um, but for my purposes, I want to make sure that we're grading everything. And, and I think the big thing for me, anytime I've ever built out a database is that I don't throw anything away. I don't delete anything like, because there's always going to be a purpose for anything that's canceled or killed. Um, and there's also going to be always a purpose for anything that is graded poorly, right? Like, I want to know, like, what percentage of the clips that we've edited have been A's, what percentage have been B's. And so, um, obviously, if I go deeper, then I can, you know, see the clips that we have. And, you know, you know, I, then we get into greater detail. Like, I know the sport, name of the clip, obviously, what the status is, you know, whether it's a highlight or, you know, it might be. You know, we are organizing by highlights, interviews, memes, features. Is it going to be a full length episode, a podcast? Maybe it's just a sizzle reel. Um, you know, the aspect ratio, is it vertical? Is it 69? Uh, is it square? Where is it going to live? Uh, what channel is it going to live on? Um, certainly the release date, right? It doesn't have a date because it's ready for scheduling. Um, whatever that post copy might be, holy smokes. Um, 
and then you know who our guest is going to be like you know and, and we're, we're linking that to um you know our, our talent so you know if we have like our golfers or our athletes we'll be linking that back uh there um and then certainly what the file name is coming from post who our editor is maybe i'll delete that you know i don't want you to know anybody's name but i'll scroll back um you know who our who our you know who our editor is um you know what the frame link is so we're using frame io for our postings certainly what the grade is and then where the where the files are living and i'm probably gonna probably gonna blank that out too because i don't want people going into seeing where those files are um you know trt what the ig link is what you know where it's going to live on TikTok, if it's going to live on TikTok or ig and then music information so you know for me it's really important just having as much information as possible in the database um mm -hmm. so that you know we can always go back and track things a certain way um and then additionally like you know this is our grid view um we've built out a, a, a kind of a trello kanban view for the same thing so obviously everything cards here are you know the same way that everything is you know ready for scheduling scheduled or aired and then you know our other statuses we've got you know ideation pitched pre-production something's been recorded it's an edit needs to be graded final tweaks which is not a technical term um so that's kind of our, our basic pipeline for for all of our social content um and then on the calendar so, side yeah yeah sorry just want to jump in and just uh just clarify this is all amazing love seeing this and so clip a clip could be anything it could be an interview it could be a social uh post like it could be anything right yeah and so right now this is our like entire post production pipeline so you know mm -hmm. at some point like once we once we get bigger teams and like if we have like a dedicated social team or a dedicated say feature team or, or longer form you know we might break up this process but again like even even in something like Airtable like if I wanted to just filter this out you know or I'm going to say like I only want to see you know things where like the video type is you know say uh, a highlight right and yeah. then I can just, you know, show myself. So like, it's easy for me to be able to, to filter things out. Or if I, you know, if I only want to see things that are memes, obviously we don't have, you know, um, any memes there, but you know, it, yeah. it, it would make it easy for me to be able to kind of filter things out and I can create views. Um, and that's one of the things I like about just working in a database and like any database mm -hmm. for that matter. And I think a lot of the, a lot of them have the kind of same functionalities is that you can just kind of use filters and, and views to filter things out. Um, which right. makes it really easy for you to just be able to see your information the way that you want to see it. If I have a team that's mm -hmm. only working on longer form content, then I can create a view for them. You know, I can, you know, just create a view for them and, you know, say, call this, you know, long form view and then, you yeah. know, filter it and then just, you know, filter it out. So like, I only want to see where, you know, my video type is say, you know, a full length episode or something like that. And right, then, right. you know, we can even create views, you know, if I only, and like, I also want to see where like only, you know, I only want to see things that are, you know, only, you know, say A's or A minuses or, you know, it's something like that. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of functionality or like where I can and how I can um, clean up information and just sort information to make sure that mm -hmm. we're seeing it the way, exactly the way that we want to see it. Um, yeah. And that's just one yeah. of the reasons I like databases in general. Like they just, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose if everybody in the world knew how to use a pivot table or VLOOKUP, we may be mm -hmm. able to achieve some of the same success, but not everybody knows how to do like VLOOKUPs and pivot tables. So, yeah. Yeah. It's super interesting to see this from uh, someone uh, that's had your types of roles where you're like producing such a volume of content. Uh, you yeah. Know, the world I come from is like more like your traditional uh, project that takes you three to four months to complete, uh, you know, whereas it seems like you're just like cranking out content as a media company would. And so, uh, it's interesting. So you're just basically like creating an instance of the clip in here as a, a database entry, attaching your resources, tagging it, and then just tracking that through your pipeline. And then that links out to your frame IO or any sort of external tools you're using within that or around that. Yeah. It's a little bit manual in that regard, right? So like, for example, like it's not integrated say into frame, right? So we would have to like manually put the frame link in there or, you know, wherever the file's living, like the permanent file, we'd have to manually put that in there. So there's definitely mm -hmm. some more manual stuff that we have to do or that our post-production team has to do to make sure that like all of the information is in there. 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that is really important to me, right? To make sure that like, again, I never want to have like somebody has to come to me and say, hey, where does this clip live? Or, hey, where's the live link to that? Mm -hmm. Like, it's really important for me to build these systems out and to create that muscle memory across our teams so that when something goes live, you always put that live link in there. And so like if a client is asking for it, if a partner is asking for it, if a sponsor is asking for it, it's really easy just to find that link, give it to them. Um, and, and, and everything is in the database. And I think that like, that's just a case in, in how you find information, but then there's also like just reporting and, and, and kind of finding some, um, some trends and, and, and stuff like that, which, which allow you to kind of work a little bit smarter and more effectively. Yeah. Complete data. Yeah, no, it's like, I'm, I, I always say that like, I'm the, I'm like the Frodo Baggins of production. Like, I just want like the one ring to rule them all. Um, yeah. and like, I just like, I want every, and it's impossible, right? Like, I think every system that I've ever used, you know, has strengths and, and, and then, you know, like Airtable, for example, and I love Airtable, but like, I'm not a big fan of their calendars. Right. Whereas like, I've worked on like programs like assemble and I think your calendars are really great. Or maybe like Smartsheets yeah. has really good calendar. Okay. Microsoft Project has really calendar. Um, but then I don't really like the way that Smartsheet like works as a database. Um, yeah. And so, and so like, I think I talk to other heads of production about this all the time because all we mm -hmm. want is for like, <laughs> like the perfect system. And I just don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, but I think we're in probably the best place we've ever been. I mean, you tell me. I mean, yeah. I think we're in a really good place as far as like what's available for, as far as SaaS solutions go. Yeah, well, that's what we're working on. Uh, you know, uh, don't want to turn this sure. into an ad, but, you know, our goal is to, to, to get everything all in one place. So that's our goal. But I, I, I totally love seeing these workflows and seeing what other experienced people like yourself are using. It's, it's very insightful yeah. for me personally and, of course, for our listeners as well. And I know you're just ramping up into this new role here, but, you know, at, at the peak of this system, like when you were at Complex or wherever, like, how many clips would you have in here at once? A complex? I mean, complex, the, actually the interesting thing at complex was, so complex was such a diverse organization, right? Because we had full size run. I'm sorry, not full size run. At complex, we had um, uh, first we feast. We had complex kind of the mother brand. We had our branded teams. Um, we had uh, soul collector, which was our sneaker vertical. And so you had a lot of different teams producing content like creatively, right? First we feast had their own mm -hmm. producers, complex had their own producers, our branded team had their own producers. And each of those teams, when I came in in 2019, they all worked really differently, right? Because they were led by different leaders. And so when I started a complex, like my instinct was like, all right, I'm going to build a system and everyone's going to come and work in my system and it's going to be amazing and you're all going to love me. And I, and I realized pretty quickly, like that's just impossible. Um, mm -hmm. Because we, what we had was we had really strong leaders on these different verticals who had systems that worked. And so what I had to do kind of coming into it was just make sure that I didn't F up their systems. And so we did use Airtable as far as like a repository for where things lived um, like as a final resting place. And that was really effective. Mm -hmm. Like we had like a, an amazing database for all of our shows. We linked it to our talent so that like when like we were in a meeting for sneaker shopping and Joe LaPuma's like, oh, how many football players have we shot the last three years? And I can just go into it and say like, all right, you know, because we were tagging all of our guest talent with affinities or like we were tagging them like, you know, so we were able to look up information really quickly. But on the planning yeah. and scheduling side, interestingly enough, all of the teams worked on different calendar systems and they all had their own mm -hmm. systems. And I kind of took a step back and decided to not F with that. Um, we had been flirting, you know, when, you know, before the, before the BuzzFeed layoffs in December of 2022, we had been talking to Reich and we were looking at them maybe as a permanent solution for that. Um, which I really liked a lot. We had been talking to, we had talked to Monday. Um, and then obviously I was trying to build something out in Airtable. But again, I don't love Airtable's calendars and I don't love like their scheduling uh, abilities, right? So I ended up not building anything out in Airtable, which would have been a dream. Um, to be honest, I'd, you know, I would have loved something like Assemble because that would have allowed us to do it. But um, also yeah. you have to get buy-in from like leadership. It's, it's a lot to kind of build these big systems, but yeah, scheduling all of the different teams scheduled their shows themselves. And I kind of backed off, but because yeah. we were always on and because like we had 36 episodes of hot ones, 36 episodes of sneaker shopping. Um, it was like, we didn't take breaks. So it was really easy for, um, 
for us to stay on track. And, and we had great producers who were able to do that. So, Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. Switching off, you know, would love to just hear about uh, what you're uh, getting into now. I know you just were hired for a new role. Would love to hear what's yep. next. Yeah. So I just started um, as head of content at Pro League Network. Um, so, I mean, as of as of today, I'm, I'm a couple of weeks on the job. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity for me. So um, Pro League Network is uh, the, the founders, Bill, Bill and Mike. Basically, what they've kind of uh, realized or their theory is that in the in the live sports world, um, there's a real big white space around when people are able to watch content. Right. And so I think if you look at like right now, for example, today is is May 18th. Uh, I think the Lakers are playing tonight and then there's going to be a yet. bunch of baseball. Oh, come on. I, I'm not into this. I'm not, I have no opinion on this. Um, you know, so the Lakers and Nuggets are playing tonight. There's going to be a bunch of baseball games, but there's nothing really during the day. Well, it's Thursday, so there might be a couple of day games. And so if you're somebody who's, say, like a, even a, a casual or even an ardent a sports better, right, and you're, you're betting on sports, there's really nothing for you to bet on during the day on a day like today. And so what we're basically doing is we're either outright – buying or working with existing leagues in sports that you may have heard of, but you didn't know that they were professional sports like professional mini golf. Um, and so we have that with the World Putting League or sports that you may have never heard of like car jitsu um, or a, uh, a board game called Karam, which is a uh, it's a board game that's huge in India uh, and, and, and South Asia that you may have never heard of. And so like we're working with all of these really niche sports. And, and, and our theory is like we're going to fill the schedule in times where there aren't, say, like big four sports. And we're going to create opportunities for you not only watch sports, but bet on them. And so what we're doing is we're going around the country and we're working with regulators across different states, right? I, I, I believe there are 35 states, including, uh, or 35 states and the District of Columbia, I think it's 34, 35, where sports betting is allowed. And we're working with state regulators to get these sports licensed for um, legal betting. And then we have an integrity officers and we're working with integrity companies to make sure that everything is safe and that everything is legal and that everything is buttoned up. Um, and Bill and Mike can speak so much better about the, the legalities and all of that. Um, but it's a really exciting company because we're taking a lot of sports that are really fast and really quick and creating opportunities for, for sports fans to bet on them. And uh, if you haven't watched professional mini golf or you haven't watched uh, car jitsu, which by the way, car jitsu is amazing. It's literally ju it's jiu jitsu inside a car. And like, I can't say enough about this. Like it's, it's wild. Um, and they're like, they're like some rules that really blew me away. So for example, I guess in regular jujitsu, you're allowed to use your gi or like the belt from your gi. You're allowed to like use it as a submission. And I don't know if you're a jujitsu mm -hmm. fan or not. Mm -hmm. um, no, no. And so in karjitsu, you are allowed to use like a seatbelt um, as like a tool to like submit somebody. And the whole idea is that you have to submit your opponent. Like there's a steering wheel and like you can use all the parts of the car. It's, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a wild sport. Um, but, but it's a lot of fun to watch. And so that's what I'm doing right now. So um, I'm heading up our content efforts, working on our live broadcasts, working with our social team, um, working on our, our website content, working with our partners across uh, all of our betting partners, and then working with our uh, growing a, a network of, of creators and, and partners across the entire sports landscape. So it's, it's a lot yeah. of fun. I'm really excited. I'm really excited for this one. And I get to work back in sports, which I haven't done um, in a really long time. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a massive content opportunity, um, just all these different sports and the way you can cover them live in both, you know, original content and all these different types of things you could create around that. So that sounds, uh, sounds really exciting. Getting back just to you personally and uh, yeah. away from the production stuff. Um, sure. Would love to know, you know, just some stuff like what are you watching these days? Like what kind of TV shows, films, like what, what are you into? I watch so little. I mean, to be honest, the thing that I'm doing the most right now is I'm playing the new Zelda game. Like, if I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Tears of the Kingdom came out, and so today's what May 18th. Tears of the Kingdom came out last Friday. Um, I'm trying to devote as much time as possible, but like that's happening at like 11 p.m. 
Um, <laughs> but to be honest, I've been watching like, a, I mean, during the day and like, like, you know, kind of like my working hours and like, I'd say like my working hours, like go to like, you know, whatever, eight, nine, I'm watching a lot of sports. Like I'm watching a lot of like sports and kind of seeing what other sports are doing mm. and trying to get some, and trying to get some inspiration. So I'm watching like a lot of niche sports. I'm watching disc golf. I'm watching um, like dodgeball. I'm watching like a lot of just regular golf. There's so many golf creators and golf influencers out there. Um, and so like, I'm really spending mm. a lot of time on TikTok and a lot of time on YouTube um, just watching a lot of creator based content. Um, like I'd love to say that I watch like shows. I just don't like, and, and I think partly it's because my job is to be focused on, on what's happening on social and mobile and on the internet. And that's just more, a lot more relevant to what I'm doing right now. Um, like I'm obviously excited for like succession to end so I can like binge that in one night. Like I just saw the trailer yeah. for the bear. Like, I just saw the trailer for the bear and like, I'm going to watch that. And it's like, there are shows that I'm going to watch. Um, yeah. But I'm just not, I'm just not that excited about anything long form right now. And I'm most, I mean, again, I'm in a new job. Like I remember at complex, we took on Twitch as a client and like that first three months working with Twitch, I probably watched three hours of Twitch content every night just so I could mm -hmm. learn the platform. And like, and, and like, my wife would come into like my office and she's like, why are you watching people doing ASMR and hot tubs? And I'd be like, cause that's what people do on Twitch. Um, for the record, I, I didn't, I, I really didn't watch a ton of ASMR in, in hot tubs. Uh, what, but by the way, there's so much ASMR and hot tubs on Twitch. It's ridiculous. Um, but like, I, but, but I was like, but that's what people are watching. And now Twitch just thinks that's what I watch. Um, but like yeah. I was watching, you know, just chatting stuff or I was watching people doing gaming stuff or I was watching people playing chess. Um, by the way, chess, I mean, chess content is something that I'm watching a lot because we're doing this content with Karam, which is this, you know, mm -hmm. Indian board game. And so I've been watching a lot of like the Bote sisters and Anna Kramling and all these chess influencers, like, um, like, uh, Grandmaster Hikaru. And so all these guys who are doing chess content. Um, yeah. so yeah, I'm, I'm all, I'm kind of all over the place. And then, you know, I'm, and I'm watching the, the Nuggets beat the Lakers, obviously. Right. <laughs> I'm a Denver guy. So, you know, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm loyal. It's oh man, they town. look good. They 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 look good the other day. So I mean, they're playing tonight, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll probably I'll probably watch that tonight. Nice, but yeah, no, I love that you uh, you really just immerse yourself in uh, what you're producing and just uh, it's a it's a good approach. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I if you don't immerse yourself, I don't think they're like I can't pretend like I know what I'm talking about, right? Like I can't just I can't just assume that like. I know how people are creating content for these sports that I have never experienced or watched. And so for me, um, it's like almost kind of like, um, like method producing where like, I just go mm -hmm. so deep into the content that I'm producing and kind of force myself to become a fan of it so that I can kind of like train my mind to think about how I'm going to produce content for that sport or that vertical or that platform. Um, yeah, because a lot of it's non native to me. Right. And I think that's, yeah. that's partly a generational thing. Like a lot of every time a new content, like a new platform, a new content, it's just not native to me or, or how I'm thinking. So in order for me to get that, I have to go so hard in order to just do my best to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. And so last question to wrap up here, uh, looking back in your career, going back to when you started hoarding camera equipment, uh, when you were 20 years old or whatever that was, yeah. uh, what, what advice would you give to yourself as a young person starting their career in this industry? I mean, I think the advice I give myself, the, the advice that I would give to myself is the advice that I probably give to every young person that I, that I talk to, like, you know, it hits me up on LinkedIn or whatever. And, and, and that is just, you have time. Like there's like, I, I can't believe I've been in this industry now for, what is this 2023 this is coming up on 26 years in the industry and i still feel like i have so much time to learn and figure this all out and so when i see people who are in their say early 20s or late teens or whenever they're getting started in their career if they're 13 they're getting started like you have so much time wherever you are in your career to figure it out and to grow and to learn so that's probably number one right and then the other thing that i say is that um, and I've posted this on LinkedIn and stuff like I think that so many of our skills and production are transferable to other industries. 
Um, and mm -hmm. I and I talk about this a lot. And I think that people just need to accept that the skills that you have and the attributes that you have and the qualities that you have as a person, certainly in the workplace, are so transferable to other things in life. And so I, I just tell people, like, if you're not confident that you have the right experience or whatever for a job, think about the skills that you have and think about how they transfer to other places in life. Um, knowledge bases can be learned. Skills are transferable. And so that's the other thing I probably say the most. Um, and then the last thing I probably, I tell everyone, you know, whenever you're, you're stuck on things or if you're struggling with something and you're kind of in a hole to make your problem, everybody else's problem. Cause I think that it takes, it takes a village, especially at a company to, to fix things. And so I always tell people like, don't ever think that you're alone because you're not. And there are always people willing mm -hmm. to help you out. And if you don't have people willing to help you out the place you're working, you're, you're probably working at the wrong place. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love that. Definitely can relate to the, uh, the producer tran transferring over. I went from a producer to a product manager in a tech company. And I think, uh, it takes a lot of the same skills. So you know how jealous I am, by the way, that you did that. Yeah. Yeah. You I'd yeah. Like get into tech. No, I'm going to stay in production for the rest of my life and be miserable. But, <laughs> um, as, as somebody who like has, has leaned in so deep on these things and learns and you and I have talked about it. Like, I think it's yeah. incredible that you were able to pivot and like build the tool for what you want to do. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm in awe that you, that you pivoted, that you chose this new path and that you're building something that, that is ultimately helping so many people. So I think it's what you're doing is amazing. Yeah. I appreciate that. And it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, keeps me excited about it that I'm solving the problem that I experienced. So that's the dream. Cool. Well, thank you uh, for joining. Always good to catch up with you and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. All right, Nate, I'll talk to you soon.